The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. Today's scripture reading is found in Colossians 3. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Father in heaven, we've just been celebrating in many wonderful ways, the arrival of people way back when on the shores of this country, this continent, this nation. And we're thankful for what they endured and what has happened to this nation ever since. We are thankful, Lord, for the United States of America. But we're not half as thankful for the United States of America as we are thankful for our real home, which is heaven. Yes. So as we cultivate an awareness of our real home, may we just somehow today have a deeper gratitude for it that will make a difference in how we relate to you and to each other, our families, our neighbors. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I am really looking forward for Jesus to come again. I don't even have to ask you if you are. You've proved it. But I want to ask you the question, though, what would be the reason that you are excited and really looking forward for Jesus to come? What would that reason be? I'll tell you what my reason is. My reason for being thankful and excited for Jesus to come back again. My reason is I can't wait to get my reward. Now, you may think it's strange to hear me say that, so I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it. But I'm going to say it once more. I cannot wait to receive my reward. And I've got some good company that feels the same way. And his name is Isaiah from the Old Testament, the prophet of God. Here's what he says. You'll see it on the screen. O Zion, messenger of what news? All week long. I don't know about you. I've heard a lot of bad news. But I've come here today to be reminded of the good news. And here it is. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Is he excited? Yeah. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout. For the third time he says, shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, what does it say? Your God is coming. But notice then, yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. That tells us it's the second coming now. He didn't come the first time in power. He came in sacrifice. So he comes, he's coming in power. He will rule with what? A powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. There it is. He brings his reward with him as he comes. Do you like to know more about that reward? 
I sure do. This reward from Jesus. And would you like to be sure how you can receive that reward? Oh, absolutely you would. So let's find out. Paul actually explains it pretty good, pretty well. Better English, pretty well. So we go to Colossians chapter 3. And uh, looking at it again, as it was read by Ava and Rosie, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of where? Heaven. Not Black Friday, nor Cyber Monday. The realities of where? Heaven. Now, some of the other versions in English say it. The ESV says, seek the things that are above. Or NIV says, set your heart on things above. The voice says, set your mind on heaven above, where Christ sits in the place of honor at the right hand of, God, of God's right hand. Now, I want us to ponder, as that text stays on the screen, you can refer to it constantly here as we talk about it. Now, I want to ask the question, what does this text say? I'm going to throw out three ideas, three suggestions to you. As you look at that text, what does it say? First of all, it says to me that if you take this new life with Christ seriously, if you take this new life with Christ seriously, it means that you will set your heart and mind on things above in heaven. Does that make sense? You see that's what that text actually does say? You take seriously this new life with Christ that begins at conversion and rebirth, then you will set your mind and your heart on things above. Now, when you set your heart and mind on something, that gets priority. That's the main thing. There are other things that do take your attention, but it's not the main thing. And this is where we do set our minds and our hearts on the things of heaven. That's the first thing that this text says. As I look at it, there's a second thing that it says, and that is to think about heaven, the things above, to think about heaven is the same as to think about Jesus. Paul, when he writes here, he writes about heaven and Jesus in the same sentence, he says it in the same breath. He cannot think about heaven unless he's thinking about Jesus. So I ask you, how often do you and I talk about heaven and not even talk about Jesus? Oh, we talk about the streets of gold and all the wonderful things up there and how nice it's going to be there to live with different neighbors and what we have now. You know, we have all wonderful things to talk about heaven. And we don't even mention Jesus. But Paul, no. When you talk about heaven, you're talking about who? Jesus. That's the second thing that this text says, as I understand it. The third thing that it says here is that Jesus is not on the cross. He is not buried in the tomb. He rose and he ascended to this glorious, this wonderful place of honor, which is called the right hand of God. And that is a very wonderful passage, concept to understand. The right hand of God means that's where the power is. That's where the authority is. That's where the the honor is. You get that? Jesus is at the right hand of God. That's where he ascended to. That's where we must be thinking about, set our minds on. Jesus, not just Jesus on the cross. Not just Jesus who was buried and was, rose back to life. But the one who ascended and is now seated at the right hand of God. The place of honor. The place of exaltation. The place of power, the place of authority. That's where we should be thinking about Jesus when we think about heaven. And so here's what it is. And if you think about this concept of honor, I just want to throw this in for you to think about. When the Bible talks about honor and connects it with Jesus, it uses a very interesting word which refers to how important Jesus is. How weighty Jesus is. How influential. How valuable Jesus is. And the word the New Testament uses for that is the word glory. 
Glory is a very difficult word for us to explain. You can't find words adequate to describe what glory is. But we try. And it refers to his honor, his, his power. It refers to the weightiness of Jesus, the importance of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, his honor, his glory. So when we're looking to Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, the place of honor, we are looking at the glory of Jesus. The glory of Jesus. So now let me put us all together here. So far, what does this text say? I think it says, as I understand it, pulling it into one capsule, is a Christ-centered life, that is the life, the risen, Christ, the risen life, the new life that's given to us in Christ. A Christ-centered life has the heart set on the glory of Christ. He's at the right hand of God, the glory of Christ. That's what this text says to me. This is a rich text, wouldn't you say? It's a powerful, wonderful, rich text, and you didn't even say amen. But that's what the text says in my understanding. But there's an implication, and this one is going to rock your boat. I didn't say it'll take you off your seat, because I don't know what you'll do if you get off your seat. But here is the implication of this text, and it's found in another passage Paul wrote, and this is Ephesians 2 verse 6, and the NLT puts it this way, for God raised us, and we read that just, we, just a moment ago, God raised us from the dead along with Christ, that's the new life he gave us, and he seated, this time it doesn't say seated Jesus on the right hand of God's power, it says he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Do you get that? I mean, Jesus didn't go and take this place of honor at the right hand of power in heaven just for himself. He took us with him. He's not alone. He's got his family with him. Not occupying some place of lesser honor. He's given you and me because we are in Christ, with Christ. Because he has risen us with this new life in Christ. He has given us the same place of honor that he occupies. Wow. I mean, can we believe it? And when did he do that? He doesn't wait till the second coming to do that. He did that when we expressed our faith in Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, as our substitute, as our righteousness, as our new life. That's when he does it for us. He does it this side of the second coming of Jesus, which means you and I now sit at the right hand of God by faith. Do we believe it? That's the thing. That's the thing. We are given, let me say it again, we are given the glory of Christ, the weightiness, the value, the importance, the honor of Christ. It's given to us. So let me just simply ask you, right now, just in the honesty of your heart, do you believe that you are seated right now by faith at the right hand of the glory of Christ, of God? Do you believe that? You know, to believe that simply means also then <laughs> that you're going to be more interested in what's going on up there than what you are down here. Because that's where you are really seated. That's the, he calls it there the realities of heaven. That's the reality. The reality is not down here. This is all just passing by. It's not the real thing. The real thing is what's in heaven right now, at the right hand of God, where you are by faith with Jesus. And because that's real and you believe that, you will set your mind and your heart on what's happening there. That means... The perspective of Jesus, what's going on in his mind, what's going on in his heart, is what you want to have in your mind and in your heart. Because it says, set your mind and your heart on those things. The perspective of Jesus. That means the way Jesus thinks about you should be the way you think about yourself. And he just loves you. The way Jesus thinks about the Bible, about the church, about the world is the way that you, therefore, learn to think about the Bible, the church, and the world. The way Jesus thinks about the person you don't really like so much, 
is the way Jesus wants you to think about that person. Not the way you think, but the way Jesus thinks about that person. You see, your mind is now set on the things that are above. The implications of that are amazing. And when we do that and we cultivate that, it shapes us. It shapes our minds, our lives. It prepares us for, in fact, the day when Jesus will return. And then when Jesus comes, you will have his glory in reality while you now have it by faith. Because your mind has just been so set on him. As the Bible says, let this mind of Christ be in you. It's been cultivated. You deliberately tear your mind away from the grime, the nonsense, the troubles, the sad stuff on this earth that the devil wants us to be glued to, and you fix your mind on the perspective of Jesus Christ. Now, you talk about thanksgiving. I want to tell you, friends, when you receive this new life of Christ and you believe that you are seated with him at the right hand of God, and that he shares his glory with you, I want to say that is the most important reason to give thanks and to have gratitude right now. Now, I'm grateful for family and friends and good food and living in the United States. I'm thankful for all those wonderful health. You know, you got your list. I got my list. I'm deeply thankful for those things. But have you taken a moment to think about what is infinitely greater reason to be thankful? And that is to be seated now with Christ at the right hand of God. Those are the eternal things. These other things are passing away. I'm sorry to tell you. They are transient. They are moving away. We don't have them forever. That's why we're thankful for them while we got them. But when they're away, what then? When we lose all these things, what then? Do we have the perspective of Christ, the honor of Christ? We are seated there with him in glory. The message from Eugene Peterson puts the same passage this way. Sounds very different, but just take it in. He says, pursue the things over which Christ presides. Pursue those things. Don't shuffle along, eyes on the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up, he says, and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. And you love that? And the only way I can try to understand that is, is I get into an aeroplane, and you've done that as well, and you notice as this aeroplane takes off from the airport, which is your home base airport, and I've done this, as this plane takes off and it shoots into the air, I look through the window and I look down and I try and recognize the places there, because I can now have a kind of a bird's eye view, and I'm looking for the roads that are familiar to me, the highways, I look for the neighborhoods that are familiar, the buildings, maybe I'll see the neighborhood where I live, the rivers. But you know what I notice? It doesn't look the same. In fact, it looks so different that I don't even recognize it anymore. What is considered home to me when I'm driving around in those roads and those neighborhoods between those buildings in a car, I'm down on ground level. I recognize those places. It's home for me. It's not foreign. But as soon as I'm in the air and I'm looking from up there, I can't find those places. They look foreign. They, they look strange. They don't look like home to me anymore. And then I realize that when I keep my focus fixed on the things that are familiar, the things that are comfortable, the things that I consider home, I miss out on the perspective that Jesus has from above. Where down here is no longer home. He's got a new home. He has a place prepared for us, which is in reality our home. And then as that song we've just sung says, I'm a pilgrim of what's down there. It's not home. I'm a stranger down here. Because that song says, my longing heart is there, not here. That's the perspective of Jesus. I am a pilgrim. I'm a stranger. And here's why. Because it says in verse 3 of Colossians chapter 3, coming on, onto the screen, for you died, here it is, for you died to this life. You're flying up now in your mind by faith. It's all unfamiliar stuff now. You've died to this place that is really being called home. You've died to that. And your real life, your real home is hidden with Christ in God. That's the reality. 
That's the reality. And now look at this. This is absolutely amazing. Verse 4 of this passage. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, when? At the second coming to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. You will share in all His glory. You now have a share in that glory by faith. But then it will be reality. What will that be like? Talk about a reward. Really, to share in the glory, all the glory of Christ. What a reward. What a reward. Our reward, he says, is sharing in Christ's glory, his honor, his value, his weightiness. And I tell you, friends, that reward excites me. I cannot wait to receive that reward. I cannot wait. Everything else is of lesser importance and value. And to say that the things that I have now, which I do appreciate and thankful for, to say that that is my glory, is to miss out on the ultimate glory, the glory of Christ. That reward motivates me, you know, to want to live in a way that kind of reflects my reward, my real home. I fail in doing that so often. But that is my wish and my desire. Now, if you took time, which we won't do today, to read the rest of Colossians chapter 3, you will see how Paul gives a lot of detail about this new life in Christ. This life which has the eye fixed upon the glory of Christ, which is our reward. So how will we live? And he has a, a very extensive list of things that he talks about that we will set out of our lives, push out of our lives, and the things that we will adopt into our lives. But I want you to see how he ends it in verse 24. This is Colossians 3, 24, and he says, Remember now that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. What is that inheritance? Sharing the glory of Christ. What a, what a, what a precious thing. So I want to just admit to you today, that's my obsession. My obsession is the reward of sharing the glory of Christ. Now, I do get distracted from time to time, as is normal for all of us. But then the Word of God pulls me back. You know, the Bible is like God's sticky notes pasted all over my day as I look at the Word of God to remind me that this is not my home. The glory of Christ is my reward. It's what I'm heading for. And so according to Colossians chapter 3, the second coming of Jesus and the reward that is ours now by faith, the reward of being seated with Christ at the right hand of glory and to, have, and to share in the glory of Christ, that reward motivates us to live now in a way that reflects the reward, that reflects our reward. Yeah. Well, this reward of the glory of sharing the glory of Christ is so mind-boggling, is so beyond anything we can understand. We have to think hard about it and long about it. But, you know, it is real. It's almost like it's too good to be true. How do I understand that? How do I wrap my mind around that? But I do know it is real. It is real. That's why I want to read often about it in the Scripture. So here's another one, found in Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. Paul is writing here still. And it says there, Therefore, since we have been made right with God in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. We are right with God. What a wonderful thing that is. But he doesn't stop there. He says, Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, which is the same as being seated at the right hand of glory in heaven. Christ has brought us there by, by that faith we have in His sacrifice for us. Then notice, and we confidently and joyfully, read the rest with me, look forward to sharing God's glory. There it is again. What are you looking forward to? Having a sick, free eternity in heaven. Yeah, that's wonderful to look forward to that. 
to live in a heaven where there's no conflict, where there's no trouble, there's no pain, there's no suffering. No, yeah, I love that. But friends, that, it, you know what? It will take you about two seconds when you arrive in heaven to get used to the fact that there's no more sickness, trouble, heartache, and sorrow in my life. It'll take you two seconds to get used to that, but I'll tell you what, it will take you billions and billions and billions of years to get used to the glory of Christ. So we now share in it, and we're going to share in it forever, and it will forever be more and more special as it unfolds to us as an infinite mind, which is God's, works with our minds, which are created minds, to fathom, enjoy, and live with this glory of Christ. What a reward. What a reason for thanksgiving. What confidence to face the future, to walk in the next day that lies ahead, to face whatever facet of life comes to us here on earth. I want Jesus to return because he has a reward for me. And that reward being sharing in the glory of Christ is something I, I want more than anything else. I've got to talk a little more about glory because it's a word that we don't use very often or understand very well, but in the Greek, this word glory sounds very different. It's doxa. Everyone say doxa. It's a great word to give your dog. Next dog you get, doxa. But in English, we try to find words to match it, and we fail hopelessly, but at least partly we try to get to it. In English, that word glory really means literally weighty. Or it means important, and we used the word honor before. Well, if you read other places in the Bible, the word glory is used to describe brilliance and uh, a great uh, picture of a sunset. You know, we say, what a glorious sunset that is. Brilliant, it's beautiful. That's also glorious. Different ways it's used. But the way Paul uses it in the text that we've been looking at here, glory refers to the honor that was given to Jesus when he arrived back in heaven after it finished his work of salvation here on this earth. And it is the word. Glory is also the word that Paul uses to describe the honor which believing Christians now have being seated with Christ at the right hand of God's power and which they will have in reality when Jesus comes. So that is the reward, sharing in the glory of Christ. Another word that is difficult for us to understand is that this is a reward. Have you been thinking about that? If it's a reward, please don't think of this reward as something that we have to earn and work at and deserve. That's usually how we think about reward, isn't it? That's not the way it is, really. Well, you say, really? Aren't there texts in the Bible that says that? Well, we look at one of them in Matthew 16, 27, which says the Son of Man will come with his Father's glory, with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. That sounds so much like a reward is something you've earned and worked for, and God is now paying you for all the trouble you've gone to to do something. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Well, there's another meaning for the word reward, fortunately, in the Greek. And that is something promised under oath. Now, we don't think about that so well when we talk about reward. But as far as God is concerned, from his perspective, remember our thoughts are now on heavenly things, God's perspective. And when God thinks about a reward, he is not thinking of something that you have to achieve under his whip, under his expectations, under his demands, under his pressure. He thinks about the reward he's going to give you as a promise he made to you under oath. Jesus promises that those who remain in him, as an illustration... In John chapter 15, he says, 
Those who remain in me and I remain in them will do what? They will produce, it says, much fruit. They will produce much fruit because they are in me, they remain in me, and I remain in them. They will produce much fruit. And that much fruit refers to obedience, doing good things, living the life of Christ. So where did that life come from? Did we manufacture it? Well, then we've read that text totally wrongly. It says, because we remain in him and he remains in us, we will then produce much fruit, which comes from where? From remaining in him and him remaining in us. It's actually that we produce, he produces that obedience, those good deeds, that new life. He produces it in us and he says, you're doing it. Wonderful. You're doing it. You're doing it. It's like when I learned about to ride a bicycle and my dad was holding the back saddle and uh, he would walk behind me and I'd kind of look back, you know, is this all good? He'll say, you're doing great, you're doing great, but he's holding the saddle, he's holding me up. you doing it. Whereas it is him doing it through us. Here's an example, 2 Timothy. I'm going to go there. Here it is. The prize, the reward awaits me, says Paul. What is that reward, that prize? The crown of righteousness. Have you ever thought of that as being earned and deserved and worked for? Absolutely not. He says, the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. That's a parallel passage to all the rest. See, the crown of righteousness never earned is a reward for having faith in God's promise that he has made to you under oath called the new covenant. So sharing in God's glory is your reward for believing God's gospel. Sharing in God's glory is your reward for believing in God's gospel. A lady once uh, going through the mall lost her purse, desperate, couldn't find it, but there was a young fellow, honest at heart, who found her purse and returned it to her. And when she got her purse back, obviously she recognized that purse. She opened it. And she said, um, with a little fellow standing there, she said, hmm, this is funny. When I had my purse, I know there was, a, there was a $20 bill in there. But now, it looks like there's, it looks like, I love that sound. Just say amen, everyone. Jaden, God bless you, brother. Thanks for being here, Jaden. You know what? Those are the cries of joy. Just believe that. Let's go over that. I love that. That sounds far better than the snores of saints in church, I tell you that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Come back, Jaden. Yeah. Back to the lady. Lost her purse. Little guy finds it, brings it back to her. She opens it. She says, that's funny. I know there was a $20 bill in here. But now it looks like there are $21 bills in here. And the little fellow says, yeah, isn't that really funny? Because the last time I found a lady's purse, there wasn't any reward change in the purse. <laughs> you see, this little guy, smart as he is, made sure that there would be enough reward change for him to get his reward. He was not going to miss out on the reward. Do you know that there's a way in which you can ensure that you will not miss out on the reward of sharing in Christ's glory? There is a way. There is a way. And let me put it on the screen found 
in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. He called you. God called you to this through our gospel that you might share in what? The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Through the what? The gospel. When you believe with all your heart this gospel of Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life for you, who died a substitutionary death to pay the penalty for the sins that you're guilty of, and then he places his robe of righteousness over you that you are declared righteous by God. When you believe that gospel, you then can also believe that you are seated now with Christ at the right hand of God, sharing in the glory of Christ. And you can believe that when Jesus comes back, he'll call your name and you will look up. And he will reach down and take you home, your real home, the home where you now in reality will in eternity share in the glory of Christ. What a joy. What a glory. What a reason to live. What a peace. What a pleasure. As we pray, Lord, I just want to thank you so much that we have the reality of that glory to, to live in and enjoy in amid this world of tempest and trouble. Thank you that that glory is not far-fetched. It is earned for us by Jesus. It is given to us by a loving God, something we can now not just imagine but believe in and know is true. And may that indeed affect how we relate to this world, to each other, to the way we face the challenges of every day. And Lord, truly, we cannot wait for Jesus to come because we cannot wait for the reward which you have given us. Now take us from here, Lord, with your peace. Let the power of your Spirit lead us. And may we walk by faith in Jesus' name. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.